Hi everyone. So I want to start off by telling you all a story about something that happened to me a few years ago. And I was interviewing for this company for this test engineering position and I was super nervous. Um, so I went into this interview and I'm, I think I'm answering all the questions correctly and I'm feeling pretty good. And at the end of the interview, the, the interviewer asked me if I had any questions for him. So I asked him about their staging environment and how releases work and um, who handles their different testing environments. And he stopped me and, and they said, he said that they don't have a staging environment that they test in production. And I was so shocked. I was like, what do you mean you test in production? Is this like a trick question? Um, he could see that I was really confused. So he asked me to do something that I want all of you to do now. I want everyone to think about the last feature that your team deployed. Is it working right now in production? How do you know? Your users haven't reported anything to you and your alarms haven't gone off, so you assume that it's working, right? But you don't know. Testing in production is the only way to know that your features are working in production right now. So testing in production means testing your features in the environment that your features will live in and not using a dummy environment like staging or QA or test. And it's important to note that it's not a replacement for, for all of your testing, which we're going to get into a little bit later. So let's talk about what's wrong with staging environments. And th these are things that I've learned through my experience and my research. So the first thing is that staging environments are expensive to maintain. And if you just take into account a basic website architecture um, of web servers sitting in front of a number of application servers that query a database plus a memory-based cache. You're looking at over 100 grand per year, and that's not taking into account software licenses, support, infrastructure, so it can add up. Staging test results do not always match production test results. So imagine you're testing a feature in staging and you worked so hard on testing every requirement and you went through um, all the documentation with the product owner and you worked with your developers to fix every bug and your end-to-end -end tests are passing in staging. So you sign off on the feature and you launch the feature to production and what happens? There's a bug. So these environments are different, plain and simple, which means your test results are going to be different. Production includes uh, data that staging doesn't have and you're never going to know the differences between your test environment and production until you test there. No one cares if staging is broken. So Picture this, you are testing a high priority fix for a feature and you log into staging to test it, but staging is down, you get the 404 screen of death, so you ping the, the DevOps person, but he's not answering, so you ping someone else and they tell you to open an IT ticket and then you have to go get your manager to escalate it, and meanwhile you're testing this high priority ticket and really no one seems to care. So no one's going to get a call in the middle of Thanksgiving dinner if staging is broken. The load in staging does not match production. And when you think of the number of people who use your staging environment versus uh, your production environment, the difference is a lot. And because the load is different, the accuracy of speed and lag times is not going to be correct. And at the end of the day, I've never heard anyone speak highly of their staging environment. I know that it's risky, but we're going to go through all these risks. Um, we're going to go through um, how Testing and production can affect real end users if you don't set it up correctly. Um, and we're going to go through how to mitigate the risk of it affecting your reporting and business decisions. And we're going to go through how to make sure that your third parties are, can be integrated well with testing and production. So the first step to set up this process to set up uh, testing and production is to install the necessary tools. And the first tool you need is feature flagging, which is really the key. And feature flagging basically decides who sees which features. And it just hides, enables, or disables features at runtime. So this is how I think of um, feature flagging in my head. So basically, your developers are going to create a feature flag from the UI and then target all of your internal teammates. So this includes dev, QA, product, design, and, and your automation bots. So anything related to the feature can only be seen by the users inside of the feature flag because the feature flag is off right now. So the people on the right, these end users, they can't see anything related to the feature because they're not targeted. So if there happens to be a bug in your new feature, it has no impact on your end users because they don't have access to it. And so while the flag is off, this is when you go in and you test everything. You verify all of your proper functionality. You fix all of your bugs. Um, and then once you're done testing and you know your feature is working in production, you turn the feature flag on 
already knowing 100% that your features are working in production and you didn't break anything that was existing. And now your users are happy because they have a perfect feature. And then you basically repeat this process with every new feature. And the cherry on top of the cake here is that when you turn on the feature flag in production, you already know that the feature is working. So there are no surprises. The next tool that you need is, is an automation framework. Um, pretty self-explanatory. It's not, it's not scalable to test everything manually, especially with the risks of testing in production. Um, so you want an automation framework that's easy to adopt, easy to debug, one that has good reporting, and one that has a good support community. And then for your job schedule, are you, you're going to need a job schedule that's going to run your tests for you. It can be a simple cron job or through a test scheduler like Jenkins. And then you need an alerting tool. So you need an alerting tool that can be integrated with your job scheduler. And it's important that everyone on your team from product to design to engineering is on call because everyone on the team owns product quality. Um, but these are some of the tools that um, have been uh, successful for me when I've set up testing in production. Um, so these are the ones that I'm comfortable recommending. So the next step is to create test data. So basically we need a way to differentiate test data from real data without affecting real end users. We don't want to manipulate real end users data in production. We want to manipulate test users data in production. So what we do is we're going to create a consistent naming convention for all of our test users. And these users act like real users and they look like real users, real users, but only we would be able to identify them and interact with them. So what we did was we created a new uh, Boolean in our system and set it to is test user. And the value is true for test users and automatically false for real users on the site. So then in your data dog dashboard, you can exclude all the actions done by users whose is test user boolean is set to true. And then you have this backend flagging system that's used to identify testing entities. So if the flag was on, you know that this page or this object or this thing in production is a test entity and it should not be included in any data and analytics. And it can be put in a different table in data docs so that you can clearly separate test data from real data. And you just want to hard code in your automation scripts to make sure that your test entities only interact with each other. And if something fails, you need to get alerted and figure out what's going on. So the next step after um, you have your test data is to write your tests. So I really like BDD. It's really easy to read and to write just simple cucumber with gherkin given when then. Um, and then when you're handling third parties in your tests, what's worked best for me is to have a header in the API request that you send to the third party and then work with the third party and tell them, hey, any request that you get with this header is coming from a test, so I want you to handle it differently and then just tell them what you want. I've done this a few times and I've never had a problem with it. So it's also important for you to set up alerts for um, your test setup, your actual test, and the test teardown. So in your test, this is where you perform your actions and validate functionality, but it's not the only part of, um, of testing in production. So you need to have proper setup and proper teardown for each test. And if any part of that fails, you should be getting alerted and the tests need to stop and you need to figure out what's going on. The next step is to deploy to a production canary. And production canaries just allow you to slowly roll out a change to a small subset of users before you roll it out to the entire population. And this just minimizes the impact if something goes wrong. And it's a really good way to provide risk mitigation. So if something goes wrong, would you want 100% of your issues to encounter the issue? If something goes wrong, would you want 100% of your users to encounter the issue or 1%? So the setup is just this lever in the UI that you can drag to allocate a specific percentage of traffic. And then just to summarize risk mitigation, before launch, use feature flags to target users. And then after launch, use production canaries to limit your audience. So the outcome of this process is just that everyone has a really high confidence in our releases. And this um, also caused us to have an increased developer velocity because our developers spent so much more time creating new value and new features and so much less time fixing bugs and defects. So testing in production really just promotes a proactive engineering culture. I don't want to wait until something breaks, have a user report it to me and then fix it. I want to find out what's going on and fix any issues before anyone ever sees anything wrong. And then when we think of where production tests operate, there are tests that are um, not run in production due to data issues, privacy issues, GDPR, SOCs, all that stuff. So there are um, 
different scopes for these different tests. Um, and if this is something that you wanted to do, these are the steps that I would recommend um, to implement testing in production to shift your company's testing culture. So the first is just explain why the pros outweigh the cons. Think about your staging environment and its reliability. Um, think of examples from the past. So do you remember when we merged this thing and it caused this other thing to break in production? And then think about if you can use feature flagging in your next sprint, if you can try it try it out in your next sprint. Um, I know Split has a free version that you can use to, to test out and see if it's right for you. There's always going to be those people who say testing and production will never work and you just have to stick with staging and that's the way that things have been done for so long. And to those people, I say three things. Number one, staging will never fully represent production. Number two, staging is a sunk cost and these people are not my target audience. So if this is something that you wanted to try, um, these are just the steps that you're going to take to get to testing and production. So install your tools, create your test data, write your tests, launch, um, launch your test behind a feature flag, and then deploy to a production canary and have a drink. So if, um, in case you have not been paying attention the past 10 minutes, I want you to take away two things. The first is that no one cares if your feature is working in staging. We care if it works in production. And the second is the only way to know if it's working in production is to test it in production. So um, this is my contact information. This is my Twitter. Um, you can email me if you have questions. Um, tweet me if you found something interesting today. And if you want a t-shirt, you can send an email to my friend at Split, Leah Hansen at split.io, and she will send you a t-shirt. So thanks, everyone.